ways. So we thank you for all that you have done. We thank you for the gathering that the people is not onto any part, but it is onto you. So we pray that you expand the word to each one of us and you reveal your will concerning our life in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. A very good morning again and thank you for joining us as much as possible when you come to church. I uh, will always encourage you to have uh, a piece of paper and a pen so that you can write down uh, the scriptures and when or if you can write them in your phone, that's also good. And as you go home, you can now uh, revisit uh, those uh, scriptures. Uh, because you still need uh, to meditate on the word of God during the week. So that's what uh, we do in the church. And the more you ponder on those scriptures, uh, the stronger you become in your faith. So what the Lord wants us to see in this month of uh, June, it is uh, our covenant with God and the erecting the pillars of God's house. So, covenant with God and erecting the pillars of God's house. So, we want to see the covenant with God and erecting the pillars of God's house. Many times we see things done in church and we don't know why we do them. And uh, I've always been a curious child when I was uh, very little. And many teachers did not like me because I was asking too many questions. And uh, I had two kinds of teachers. Those who put up with me because I knew all the answers, or those who were upset with me and telling me, no, you need to let other uh, children also answer the questions. And sometimes I remember when I was in the farm, sometimes they, they kicked me out of one of the lectures because I was answering all the questions. And uh, she it was a lady. She, she did not have confidence that she knew what she was teaching. And the fact that I was answering all of the questions made her feel like a useless. Well, I was trying to show off. Uh, that's not trying to show off, just I like asking questions. And when I know that this, this is wrong, I'm going to say this is wrong. So, we do a lot of things in church, but we do not know why it is done. My job is to explain why it is done. And when you know now why, then you see the importance of doing it and why God wants you to do that. We should not be ignorant of spiritual things. Now, the first point we want to define is uh, what is a covenant. The word covenant in Hebrew is the word berith. Uh, the word covenant in Hebrew is the word berith. Uh, it is, it literally means uh, to cut. You take a knife and you cut and blood uh, doshes out. Covenant is always done uh, with the shedding of blood. And many of us do not understand uh, the gravity of the covenant. Covenant is very, it means uh, cutting. And it is always very, that's B E R I Y T H. B E R I Y T H, very. Now, it is cutting. So the covenant is an alliance, it is a pledge, it is a vow. So many times we enter into covenant with people and we don't even know it. We go and pledge things. And we are now bound because we did not uh, fulfill those uh, pledges. We go and vow foolish things like uh, Jephthah. He vowed, God, if you give me victory, but he did not mean it. 
might not realize the consequences of the words that came out of his mouth that he had to perform it. And because of his mistake, his daughter remained unmarried for a whole uh, life. Don't make rushingly, don't make vows anyhow. Don't make pledges anyhow. Please read the Bible of prosperity where we explain about vows and pledges so that no one will coerce you into pledging anything. Because uh, God, in the spirit realm, you have uh, bound uh, yourself. Your children as well. Don't uh, make vows unless you mean it. Because God heard them. This is a sister, she's having a problem getting married. And uh, as I was afraid, the Lord revealed me what was the problem. And that, that was a long time ago. The Lord has taken for you, Jesus' name. And uh, the pastor used to be uh, a Catholic. And the mother made a vow that, oh God, myself, I want to be a nun. But she did not become a nun. She eventually got married, but she felt guilty. And then uh, she said, oh God, I did not um, fulfill my vow. But I want my daughter to become a, a nun. Now, years have uh, passed and she forgot about uh, that vow. And now she wanted the daughter to be married, to be a praying, fasting, praying, and fasting, praying, and fasting. But the daughter is very busy for what was wrong. In the spirit realm, something was uh, tied. So when now uh, I pray, the Lord revealed to me what the mother made out of vow. The same way with like Jephthah made that foolish vow. And only someone who has uh, spiritual authority can break that vow. So we broke that vow in the name of Jesus. That's why you need to go to church. Why? Because <clears throat> I'm going in the tangent. Why? Because in the book of the, in the book of Numbers, chapter 30, and read also Numbers chapter 33. God put the spiritual uh, parent, uh, uh, ranking. If you made a vow, if a wife made a vow or a pledge. Because she's under the covering of a husband, the, moment, the day the husband hears that pledge, she has the, the God-given authority to counsel that pledge, even if it is God who spoke it. God gave him uh, the right to do that. Now, if he does not say a thing, that's why when we hear your children say some foolish things, you need to counsel it. Because if you keep quiet by trying to appease them, and make them happy that vow is going to stand. And if he did not say anything to rebuke that vow, it will stand. And she or, or the daughter must fulfill it. Now, if uh, the two of them did something that was uh, foolish, that's why now the one that can only break that vow is uh, the shepherd. Moses in that case, or Aaron, so they'll go to the normal priest. If the normal priest also himself is in trouble, you'll go to Aaron. If Aaron is in trouble himself, you go to Moses. And if Moses is in trouble, <laughs> the anointing, Psalm 133, rock from the head of Aaron, down in the beard and to the garment, that's how the Lord commands. Uh, the blessing. There are some things in your life you cannot break them, huh? except for the church. That's why we need one another. God made it that way. You can pray, you can fast for many, many years. But Hannah was praying and fasting. For many years she was barren. Did Eli pray? 
the high priest. He did not even pray. He just said, Go home. Your petition has been answered. Those are things that children to pray. Pray, pray. But someone that has the spiritual authority, they based on the office that he's occupying, he doesn't even need to pray. Go home. Your petition has been answered. So, if you've made some foolish vows in your life because of uh, some of the things that happened to you in your upbringing, many times it is because of the way we were brought up, so because of the way we were hurt in our childhood. So, counsel those uh, vows in the name of Jesus. Marriage is a covenant, it is a blood covenant. And uh, just like we can enter into a covenant with uh, human beings, we also enter into a covenant with uh, God. Friendship uh, is a covenant. So that's why you choose your friends carefully. Jonathan and David, they had a covenant of friendship. And even if Jonathan died, and the covenant of friendship was that even if I died, you still need to do good to my children. That's why David, not that he liked it, he had to fulfill the covenant. He looked everywhere. He does not anyone left in the house of the soul, especially of the children that I made do it good. So he found Melchizedek, who was a lame, and he brought Melchizedek and made Melchizedek sit at his table to eat his bread. Because he made a covenant and he cannot break it. So we need to be very, very careful with uh, covenants. Now, point number one. Point number one, God does not go back on his uh, word. God does not go back on his word. The Bible tells us in the book of uh, Psalm 89, verse 34 to verse 35, Psalm 89, verse 34 to verse 35, God says, my covenant, one that I caught with you, my covenant I will not uh, break. No alter the things that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn in my holiness that I will not lie unto David. God is not going to lie to you. His covenant with you is not going to break it. God makes covenants with individuals. He makes covenants with families. He makes covenants with businesses. He makes covenants with churches. His covenants, God does not break them. And God also does not alter the word of his lips. Oh, I love this picture so much. I love this picture so much. I remember God coming to tell me, because what I preach is what I believe myself. The word must become flesh in you. I remember, do you know why Father Abraham had Ishmael? The reason why Father Abraham had Ishmael, it is because he believed that God will not break his covenant. That's fine. So I'm going to have a child. But, he did not believe that God also will not alter the word that have gone out of his lips. He said, okay, I'm still going to have a child. It's me, Abraham. If I cannot have it with uh, Sarah, why not let me have it now with uh, Hagar? At the end, he's still my uh, son. God said, no, Abraham, you do not understand. Not just I don't break my covenant to give you a child, but I don't alter it. I say it is with Sarah, it is with Sarah. Full stop. Do we understand those two parts of the, that, the verse? My covenant, not just will I not break, but I will not alter. 
the words that have gone out of my lips. A lot of us are looking for plan B. God does not have a plan B. He only has a plan A. And if he says this is the way it is going to be, it is the way it is going to be. He's not going to twist it. He has all the power that he needs to bring it to pass. So even if Sarah is 90 years old, I will not alter the word that has gone out of my mouth. I'm still going to give you that child the fool. Sarah, not the fool. Ishmael, Hagar, and many of us sometimes we've birthed Ishmael ministries. And it has become a problem. A problem. Ishmael, 5,000 years later, is still the problem of uh, Israel. The Arabs are still fighting the Jews. It has not changed. Wanting to wipe them out. Because we did not believe that God. Uh, will also not alter the word that has gone after his lips. God swore by himself. So in the covenant, not just we cut the blood, but we swear. So he cannot uh, lie. Now, in case you did not understand it, okay, he came down. David means, uh, David in Hebrew, in English, uh, David, David means beloved. Okay, so whenever you see John in the gospel writing by beloved, by beloved, John being the Hebrew said to you, David, David, David. So we put David in the book, beloved. Are you the beloved of the Lord? Yes. So God is saying to you, my covenant I will not break. Neither will I alter the word that have gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn to my uh, Beloved, put your name there. I will not lie. I was sworn in my holiness, I will not lie to my beloved. Now, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 33, verse 19 to verse 22. Jeremiah, chapter 33, verse 19 to verse 22. The Bible tells us, and the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that there will not be day and night in their season, then, only then, you can break my covenant also with my son David or with my servant David, so that he will not have a son to reign on his throne. And uh, the Levite, the priest, uh, uh, my ministers. Now, God is saying, every day when you wake up, the sun is out. Every night, the moon uh, is there as well. The moon regulates our calendar. The day and night are regulated by the sun. Have you ever woken up a certain day that the sun was not uh, out? Even if it is uh, covered by the clouds, the sun is always there. If you can stop the sun from rising, stop the moon from going around or, or revolving around the earth, then you can break the covenant that God made with David. David would have a song to sit on the throne, and Christ Jesus has come. He sits on the throne of David. And also his covenant with his priest. If you are serving the Lord, you and I will be made kings and priests. So there are some promises that God made to you when you preach the gospel. You need to know them. And God also will not uh, break that uh, covenant. I told you one of my stories. When I did not know the truth, my people perish by lack of knowledge. And I've not eaten for a long period of time. And then the Lord said to me, My covenant, I will not break. And he pointed me to Jeremiah chapter 33. If the sun will rise every day, the moon has on every night, and it cannot be broken that covenant, I will not also not just break my covenant with David to have the sun to sit, but also with my priests. So what did I promise? Uh, 
the priests. Do you know? I did not know. So when you read those my weekly Bible studies, they have life stories. And then I discovered the Lord said, He will not allow the soul of the priest to suffer hunger. I said, Come on, you will not allow. I said, No, I will not allow the soul of the priest to suffer hunger. So why am I suffering hunger here? And then he said, Turn to another verse. I flip the pages of the Bible. And then he said again, I will satiate to feel to the wound the soul of the priest. I said, Oh Lord, forgive me. For my ignorance, I'm not supposed to sleep without any food in my belly unless I've chosen to fast. That's why when I fast, I fill up my fridge with all the good food. I'm not fasting because I don't have the food. Because he satiates the soul of the priest, he fills him to the full. You need to know the covenant when you are serving God. My people perish purely for lack of knowledge. So you need to discover what is contained in your book of the law concerning you. Now, in the book of Numbers, chapter 19, no, Numbers chapter 23, verse 19 to verse 21. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19 to verse 21. The Bible says, this is the witch doctor. Or the divine of Allah testified of God. He says, God is not the man that he should do. He does not break his covenant with us, so he's not the man that he should do. Nor a son of man that he should repent or turn to the mind. He does not do that. God does not change his mind, he does not repent or alter the words that are going out of his lips. God does not do that. And then he said, Has he said it and we did not do it? Or has he spoken and we did not make it uh, good? Whatever God spoke, he's going to fulfill it. Now, behold, I have received a command to bless, and I have blessed. And I cannot reverse it. When God has blessed you, you are blessed. When God blessed David, David was blessed. Nobody, that, that's what I'm saying to you. No devil in the hell can stop you. Provide the only person who can stop David is David himself. The only person who can stop the priest is the priest himself. Because God is into the business of keeping his covenant. But if your covenant is a two-way thing, it's a contract, it's a treaty, it's other words for God, it's, it's, it's a pledge. A pledge, you have a part to play, the bigger person has a part to play, and you the lesser person, you have also a part to play. So as long as you play your part, God will keep his covenant. He does not break his uh, covenant. Point uh, number two. Point number two. God cuts covenant with individuals, with families, with churches, with nations, and with uh, businesses. So God cuts covenants with individuals, with families, with churches, with nations, and with businesses. The word of God that you and I read from Genesis to Revelation is what we call the logos. It is available for everyone, but not everyone qualifies for some of those promises. Because there are conditions attached to them for them to be manifested in your life. So, in the book of, for instance, Hebrews chapter 6, from verse 13 to verse 18, Hebrews chapter 6, from verse 13 to verse uh, 18, we have the terms of the covenant that are stipulated. Paul tells us, for when 
God made a promise to Abraham. Because he could not swear by no one greater, so he swore by himself. I told you a covenant is a contract. Now, I've explained that in uh, one of the Bible studies. Think of it this way. You have a check. The check is a promise. Okay? The 21st century, that is how we are going to understand it. The check is a promise. But as long as there is no signature um, that the owner of the check will count that check, that check is worth uh, nothing. No matter how many zeros you can add, uh, it is worth uh, nothing. So you need the promise and the signature of uh, the person. So that's the way, if God was here in the 21st century, that's how he's going to teach it to us. Because we understand the chain. We don't understand covenants. God always comes down to our level to explain complex things to us. So he came down at the level of Father Abraham and asked Father Abraham, what can I do to help you believe me? So I'm going to paraphrase that Hebrews 13 from verse, uh, in Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 13 to 18. I'm going to paraphrase it so that you can understand it. Now, uh, God came down to the level of Father Abraham and said, okay, Abraham, what can I do so that you can believe me that I'm going to perform my will? Because if you cannot believe it, I cannot do it. I need you to believe. Okay, Abraham, between you fellow humans, what is the guarantee that uh, you are going to keep your word to your fellow human? Abraham said, well, when we make uh, friendships or partnership or businesses, alliances, treaties with one another, what we do as humans, we swear by someone greater than ourselves. And you've been doing that all along. When I was in primary school, when I was trying to promise my uh, peer that I'm going to bring him something, I would swear on the head of my mother. I would swear on the grave. We did not know that wasn't a promise. I don't swear on the grave of my great great. We do that all the time. So we swear by someone who is greater. So, so because it, it, it is about the the honor of your family name. He said, you, you may not trust my word, but the word of my mom is good enough. The word of my dad is good enough. I cannot bring my, the name of our family to shame. So that's why I'm swearing on the head of my mom, my dad, and so on and so forth. He's greater than I. I don't want to disgrace my family. And then, okay, that's fine. We used to do that all the time when we were pagans. But God, because there's no one greater than him, than, than he. So the Bible says he swore by himself. That since there is no one greater than, than, than I, in blessing myself, I'm going to bless you. In multiplying myself, I'm going to multiply you. Is it enough for you, Abraham? Abraham said, you know, well, you know, there are some people, they don't care about the reputation of their family. They are crook to the core. 419 people. Even if they swear on the grave of the mother, they will still not do it. They will take your money and run away. Aha, uh -huh. there are some people that lack integrity. Say, yes, some of the people, they truly lack integrity. Their words are worth nothing. Okay, God said, okay, Abraham. Now, with the people whose words are worth nothing, how do you? Find them to do what to came out of the mouth as well. In our culture, we cut covenants. So we take animals and we cut them into blood spears, and the two of us walk through the pieces of uh, those animals. And if you dare to break your word, the punishment is death. So you think twice. Before you screw me over that money, because uh, I have the right. When you pass the food of blood, I have the right to kill you if you don't do it. Aha! Uh -huh. So 
when you cut covenant like that, the, in, in your heart, you will truly believe that the man will do that. Yes. Okay, then cut animal pieces. I, God, will also walk over my dead body. I'm going to do that. Did not Jesus die to give us those promises? It was all God who swore over his dead body and his own son. In blessing, I'm so by myself. In blessing, I'm going to bless you. In multiplying, I'm going to multiply you. When I understood it, I knew that God cannot break his words. He swore over the dead body of his son, Jesus, and even better, Christ has already died. He cannot go back on his words. You can take it to the back. Now, when you do a covenant, there are terms. So, Father Abraham, God stipulated these are the terms of the covenant. I have a part to keep. You also have a part to keep. When we read our Bible, we need to discover what is our part to do and what is God's part to do. Because if we don't do our part, guess what? Don't expect God to do his part. You are going to be on God's welfare system because you are his son. He's going to make sure he's told, he's going to make sure that uh, the thing that pertain to life and godliness in their supply, but the other things you need to enter through a covenant. So covenants have signs. A covenant has a sign. And many of us are entering into covenants, we don't even know it. A covenant has a sign. In Genesis chapter 17, in Genesis chapter 17, God now came and put the sign of the covenant to Abraham. What was the sign of the covenant, Sister Lydia? You don't know the sign of the covenant that God gave to Abraham. Oh, yes! The circumcision the, did not blow come out. Covenant has always been with blood. So the sign of the circumcision goes say, listen now, now that I've stipulated the terms of the covenant and I've swore by myself, I need some blood to be shed here. So take all your songs. No, you did not have a son like that. Only I had only Ishmael. Take your son Ishmael, take all your servants, those who are born in your house, and circumcise all of them. This is going to be a sign of your covenant that I have with you. Covenants have signs. Now, what is our sign of our covenant? Okay. I go student. Beatrice. Yeah. 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 What is the spiritual significance of the circumcision? Mm -hmm. Being born again. Unless you are born again, forget about all the promises of the Bible. The circumcision was the sign that the heart has been circumcised. The heart of stone has been removed to be given the heart of the flesh, like the bones has explained to them. This is not about the physical one truly, because your blood is not pure right now. It is about the blood of Jesus, which is true. And it means that you must be born again. The foreskin of your heart needs to be removed. And Paul says, Our circumcision is no longer of the flesh, but of the heart. That's the first thing, one on one. If you are not born again, forget about the blessing of Abraham. Forget. You need to be born again. By the blood of Jesus. That we should have not your own blood now, but the blood of Jesus. So, 
Circumcision has a, is the sign of the covenant. So God made the physical circumcision to the Israelites to show to everyone that they were his people. They were his property. They belong to him. And his spirit will be moving in them. Now, circumcision is the sign of a covenant. I say again, circumcision is the sign of the covenant. When you have a sign in your body, the spirit of God comes and operates in you, operates in you. Because he sees the sign, he knows that you belong to Abraham, he comes and starts operating in your life. Circumcision is the sign of the covenant. Now, do you know why God forbade us to have tattoos? Do you know why God forbade us to, to have clarification that we have in our villages? Because it is a sign of a covenant and not with God and with the dead spirits of medium. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28. The Bible says, you shall not make any cutting in your flesh for the dead. No tattoo, any mark on you. I am the Lord. Why? Because all those cuttings are signs of a covenant. And many of us, especially our children, they've taken tattoos in their bodies. And they don't know that they have invited the uh, spirits. They have entered into a covenant with uh, the spirit. The church of today, they are so ignorant of spiritual realities. There are signs of covenants. When the, the spirit sees that sign, it comes. That's why we don't do yoga. Yoga a praying position to Buddha. And when you do that praying position, the spirit sees the sign of the covenant, he comes. That's why many Christians have some Buddha in the spirit. Because they are using the body, the portion of the body, as a sign of a covenant with uh, that Shintoism spirit, with that uh, elephant spirit, with that serpentine spirit. We are entering unwittingly and known to us in covenants with uh, dead spirit, with uh, spirit of uh, all kinds of spirits. Excuse me. Yes. I'm just looking at the Africans now, you know, they see the little marks. It's to identify each other. No, it was not just to identify each other. It was done in, uh, they were shedding blood so, so that the spirit of the village, what we call familiar spirit, is going to protect the descendants. So they, the, way, the same way we dedicate children, on the eighth day, they, the devil copies everything that God does. When a child is born, God said on the eighth day you circumcise him and you come into the house of God and you dedicate him to me. From that time, my spirit will be now following that the child belongs to me. That's the mark of the circumcision, the blood. Now, what do they do in our villages? Not just in our villages, in Latin America as well, among the Aztecs, they have all those tattoos. But those tattoos are not just the tattoos of the gods of the Aztecs. And many of people in the West, they are taking those tattoos. They don't know what those tattoos mean. They are, they are gods of war. As you kill people, they put, uh, they put marks on you that the number of people that you have killed. So, and they will put another one for those who are in the, among the Aztecs in, uh, in Latin America. In my country as well, we had those people, they would. Uh, have all those uh, clarifications all over the face, but it was to dedicate them to the God of the village, so that the God of the village is going to be able to protect uh, them. 
It was also to identify that we belong to the same tribe, yes, and just like the circumcision also was to identify that these are the children of Israel, that it had the spiritual connotation. That's why when the gospel came into some parts of Africa, some parts of Latin America, one of the miracles that God was doing was to remove the tattoos and remove the scarifications. If they were rooted truly in witchcraft, one of the miracles that God was doing was to remove those uh, cuts. I used to have a lot of them, but God removed all of them in Jesus' name. I no longer, you can no longer even see all of them. God removed all of them. My grandmother, how many times they cut here, they cut here, they cut here to shed blood to those demons. And many of us are practicing the Christianity with a mixture. <coughs> Let us no longer be ignorant. So, if you had tattoos before, if it is an innocent tattoo, pray over it and let it go. But if it is a tattoo of a demon and so on and so forth, remove it. You're inviting that uh, spirit that no longer put other tattoos in your body. Very, very important. God does not blame us because we were ignorant. We did not know those things. But now that we know, we need to be very careful what we do with our body. Because we're inviting uh, spirits. No, you build your piercing. That's a good God gave them jewels. God gave God gave them nose rings, earrings, necklaces. God take them with those jewels. Don't mind those uh, how do they call themselves? Holiness, they are not holiness. Holiness has nothing to do with the way you dress. We dress decently, okay? But it has nothing to do with you not pushing up makeup. That's not the problem. Or you not pushing up your jewels. Put your jewels. When they came to marry uh, Rebecca in Genesis chapter 24, they gave her uh, earrings, nose rings, bracelets, and so on and so forth. When they came out of uh, Egypt, in Exodus chapter 11 and chapter 12, God said, go and ask articles of silver, of gold, necklaces. They gave them all of that. The book of Ezekiel chapter 16, God also comes and takes them in all kinds of jewels. So have your earrings. Put on some makeup. Look beautiful. In Jesus' the mighty name. Amen. So, that has nothing to do with the covenant at all. We need to know that. So, as long as the earth remains, the Bible says, seed time and harvest will always be. God made a covenant with Noah because Noah was the heir of the earth. After the flood, there was no one else on planet earth but Noah and his children. The same way God had trusted the earth to Adam and Eve to rule it on his behalf, to have dominion over it, God cut the covenant with Adam and Eve. After the world was destroyed, God still needs someone to cut the covenant so that he can operate on earth. Because the earth, he gave it on to mankind, to administer it on behalf of God. So God needs you so that his will will be done on earth as it is in uh, heaven. It is not going to be done automatically. That's why you say you need to pray. And pray is also entering into a covenant with God. We are going to see all those things. So God now came in Genesis chapter 8 from verse 20 to verse 22. Genesis chapter 8 verse 20 to verse 22. The Bible says, and Noah built an altar he built an altar to the Lord and took uh, every uh, clean animal and every clean bird and offered a burnt offering. So you see, he's making a covenant by uh, Lord again. For prayer. And the Lord smelled a pleasant aroma. 
And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of mankind. I will never again curse the earth because of mankind. For the intent or the inclination or the, the desire of man, the man's heart is wicked from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing that uh, as I have done. So, when you hear of a tsunami and the journalist of BBC or CNN, he says, you know, the whole earth is going to be destroyed. Or they are saying that uh, the ice is melting in the Antarctica. So very soon, the whole earth is going to melt. Don't believe them. They are pagans. They don't know. Our God said to us, never again what happened in the days of Noah will happen to us. Finished. So whenever you see God put the sign, what was the sign of that covenant? But then the rainbow. Don't mind the people that are our, our rainbow. They don't know the significance of the rainbow. Whenever you see the rainbow, it does not mean those people that uh, with all the letters of the alphabet. It means that God is saying is never going to destroy the earth again with a flood, regardless of the way mankind is behaving. But how will the earth be destroyed? Sister Lydia. By fire. The earth, as we know, is going to be dissolved by fire, no longer by flood. So, then God for global warming. Should we recycle? Yes, let us do recycling. Should we save some energy, buy some electric cars? Right. If they give me some uh, money in advance, I would buy an electric car. No problem. But I know it is not uh, the greenhouse that is going to destroy uh, the earth. And how is it going to be destroyed by uh, fire? You need to know your Bible so that you are not uh, panicking when you watch the news. God made a covenant. And he said, verse 22, while the earth remains. So as long as the earth is here, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not uh, cease. That's Genesis chapter 8 from verse 20 to verse 22. So as long as the earth remains, seed time, and harvest will always exist. So that's why God gave us a seed and bread. You decide, do you want the harvest? If you eat all your seed, there is no harvest. That system is still in place. God made that covenant with all mankind through Noah that inherited the earth after the flood. And as long as the earth remains, and as long as mankind is still around, that covenant applies with Noah. Even if you are not a Christian, there would always be seed time and harvest. So what do you do as we saw last month with your, your seeds as your responsibility? If you eat all of it, you are going to beg. Mm -hmm. Point number three. Uh, God have mercy on me. Point number three. Number four. Is it free? Point number three. Hallelujah. Point two, God made of the earth into the videos. Point three, God has signs. No, no, no. That was part of uh, the number two, yeah. <laughs> now, point number three. When you have a covenant, you are building pillars for the house of God. So when you have a covenant, you are building pillars for the house of God. And not just for the house of God, for your own house as well, for your own marriage as well, for your own business as well, for your own church as well. In the spirit realm, there are pillars that support every system. There are pillars that support your life, because your life is your, your body, the temple. So there are some things that need to be in place in your body, in your life, so that the temple can stand and not fall. In the church, is the temple as well. There are some things that need to be placed in the church 
so that the church will not collapse but uh, increase. In your family, it is a temple because your house shall be called a house of uh, prayer. And there are some things that need to be placed in your house so that your house is going to stand and not uh, collapse. So that is what we are going to see. And I'm going to see God one by one how to build those pillars. When you build those pillars, what happens is that you destroy the pillars of the, the house of Satan in your life. Now, in the book of Churches, the book of Churches, chapter 16, from verse 27 to verse 13. Churches, chapter 16, from verse 27 to verse 13. The Bible says that uh, the background of the story is that the Samson was captured. Why was the Samson captured? Because there was no holiness in his life. He was living anyhow in the sin and he thought that the power of God would still operate. Until they cut off his hair, he gouged his eyes, and he was down back. So, now that he was in prison, verse 27 says something very important. Verse 27 says, now the house, not the house of David, the house was full of men and women, and all the Philistines in the world were there. And on the flat roof were about 3,000 men and women who looked with, uh, sorry, who, who looked on while Samson was entertaining them. You see, today the church is now entertaining the world. There is now just a lot of entertainment in the church because there is no more sanctification and there is no more consecration. When Samson lost his sanctification and his consecration, he started now to entertain the, the enemy. What is left in the church a lot is all the entertainment. There is no more power. We have destroyed the, the pillars that was supposed to keep the house of God strong. One of the pillars is holiness unto the Lord. So now, when now he repented, Samson, he put his life in order. He revealed the pillars in his own life, first of all. He was now able to destroy the pillars of the temple of uh, Satan. Now the Bible tells us. Verse 30. Let me read verse 29 first of all. Samson uh, took hold of uh, two middle support pillars. So he took those two pillar support of the temple of uh, Dagon. There were two big pillars in the temple of Dagon. So Samson decided to, to, to take hold of them and pushed. He pushed so hard, those two pillars were broken and the temple collapsed on all those worshippers. He destroyed the temple of uh, the God of the Philistines and destroyed all the worshippers uh, of uh, the Philistines. In this land of Scotland, there are pillars to Freemasonry. Islam has pillars, if you don't know it, that keeps uh, Islam going stronger and stronger. The house of God also has pillars, but we don't know them. That's why we are being defeated. So we need to build up pillars in our own life so we can destroy the pillars in the life of, how do you call it, the temple of the enemy. If we take the Islam, for instance, Islam has the five pillars. And that's what makes Islam advance. If you don't, it's a spiritual thing. If you do not know why we are being defeated, then we are going to continue to be defeated. And God gave us those pillars, but we are not using them. 
Now, what does the five pillars of Islam, in case you don't know? One, they profess the faith. We Christians, we're supposed to be professing our faith, but we are ashamed of the gospel. A Muslim is not ashamed of his gospel. Even at the airport, he would have put spread his heart. He would have prayed in the middle of the airport. Why are Christians are ashamed? Even say, Praise the Lord. A Muslim is not ashamed to pray. When it is a time for the Friday the, to go at the prayer, he closes the shop. Even if you came with one million, he said, No. Prayer is a pillar. The second pillar of Islam. They pray five times a day. A church only grows by prayer and fasting. The demon also prays. Satan also is served and they pray and they fast. I used to have an uncle who was a Freemason. They pray and they fast. They go to the, tem uh, the, the temple every week. So they also have uh, the mass, but to say this. They give also, he used to give a lot of money. Giving is one of the other third pillars of Islam. For Freemason, it's the same thing. But God told us all those things. You will see, as we go, you are going to see how God made a covenant with Abraham to pray, how he made a covenant with Abraham to confess his faith, how he made a covenant with Abraham to give, Genesis chapter 14. All those things are what Abraham was doing and his children. The Jews, the whole nation of Israel, keep the time. Not just the individuals, but the whole nation. That's why Israel is blessed. You are going to understand that in Genesis chapter 14. And they still continue to do that out to today. Though they have departed from Yahweh, but they know these are some principles. We may, we may not want him, but we want his blessing. We are continuing to have those uh, pillars. One of the pillars, the fourth pillar of Islam is a fasting. That's why Islam fasts 40 days every year. The number 40 has some spiritual uh, implication. Israel also was given a day of national fast. There are things that don't happen if you don't pray and fast. When Daniel, we were in captivity in Babylon, Daniel fasted for 21 days, and then something broke in the heavenly realm. And uh, the priest of a person that was keeping the people bound. In uh, Scotland, there are two demons, two principalities, the Germany brothers, that are sitting at the sea. They don't want to have God in Scotland so that the God will not enter here. So you need to defeat those two brothers. Unfortunately, the church is blind. We think people don't just receive Jesus because no NHS. It's not about NHS, social uh, service, uh, what there is again, uh, being a universal Christ. It's not that. There are demons that are blinding. The eyes and the hearts of the people that they are not receptive to the gospel. And uh, to dislodge those demons, only prayer and fasting. Otherwise, those people remain bound. Even if God has given a promise, God prophesied through already Jeremiah and through uh, Isaiah that only 70 years of captivity, only 70 years of captivity. Daniel understood. You need to understand like Daniel. When he realized that they've done the punishment 30 years, that why was it Daniel understood by reading the book? You don't need any other prophecy. You need the prophecy of the scripture. He understood by reading the book that the time has come for us to walk out of this captivity. And then he started to fast. And then God said to him, you know what, Daniel, from the very day you prayed, 
Your prayer was already heard. God even sent an answer. But what was the problem? It was a prince of the virgin. He was holding you captive. But through your fasting, Gabriel is a messenger. In the US system, is the equivalent of the postmaster general. I don't know the equivalent in the, in the, the English, uh, the UK system. But the postmaster general in, uh, in America is the one that is in charge of all the post offices. It's like the minister of the post offices. I don't know what is the equivalent in, in Britain. So, Gabriel is in charge of all the messenger angels. He's not a warring angel. He cannot fight. Gabriel cannot fight. Have you seen uh, your post? Uh, if you have burglary, do you call your post uh, the postman? No. But if you want to write to the to the justice uh, to your court uh, case, you put your stamp. The postman will be able to deliver it. But if you need to get the burglars out of your house, you need to call the police. And who is the fasting? Michael, who is the, the priest of war. The Minister of Defense was dispatched. There are some deliverances that you are never going to have if you neglect the prayer and fasting. You may throw all your money, give your tithe, which is part of it, but the equation is twofold. The tithe is uh, the physical aspect, and the spiritual aspect is taking prayer and fasting because the devil does not want you to prosper. He does not want you to have uh, the power. Does not want the church to grow. Does not want you to come out of your immigration situation. Immigration is the principality that is sitting at the borders. When I was in Dongbe, where they would give uh, papers to draw the dealers, even to terrorists. I was sleeping with one terrorist in the same room. But because he had married someone here, they could not deport him. And they already got him the citizenship. So, they stripped him of the citizenship and they could not deport him. So after he did five years in prison, they now brought him to Dongbe, but he was in Dongbe for another two years because they did not know what to do. And then, guess what? They released him. I saw him in Gorgos. Yeah? I want to tell you, he's going to the house. He's a terrorist. I'm a choking guy. I saw him. I said, hey! So you live in Gorgos. I need to pack my belongings and leave Gorgos. <laughs> and they released him. And he didn't look me up. It is a spirit. If you fail to understand it, you are going to suffer for lack of knowledge. When Daniel understood by reading the Bible, he said, no, not even one day we are going to remain in captivity. Not even one day. And they were delivered. The prophecies will not automatically happen if you don't engage with prayer and fasting. These are two of the big pillars. And Islam is advancing because of the pillars. Though they are praying to Satan, but the power is being released. And we that have it in our book, we don't do any of it. And uh, the fifth pillar of Islam is uh, the pilgrim to Baka. Did God command some pilgrim to Israel? Which one? One of them is today. There were three of them. You see, you read your Bible, you don't understand the spiritual formation of Israel. There were three feasts that they were supposed to go to Jerusalem all the time. Wherever they were, Passover, one of them. Feast of uh, Tabernacle, which is uh, Christmas for us. And then Shavuot, which is Pentecost today. If you do not understand that these are spiritual formation in the spirit realm, for God to release his power on the day of Pentecost, when they come and what did come down? Power from on high. Power was released from on high. 
That's right. Power was released from on high. Because if they those, that's why you see some, some church, they will do conferences. What they are trying to do is to cover the people so the people can come and pray. They will start to sometimes do it twice a year, three times a year. They are trying to reproduce those uh, pillars. So that's why you want to see some big ministries. They have annual conventions. They don't tell you what they are doing, but they tell you what they are doing. They are building the pillars. <clears throat> so if we don't know those things, then we are going to be defeated by uh, the enemy. And uh, God said that we come three times uh, a year. But God realized that it was not enough. So that's why now Ezra built the synagogue. You come in that formation every Sabbath. That's why also we meet every Sunday. Why? Because it is a pillar of your Christian life. Psalm 84, verse 4 to verse 8. Some of you who are staying at home, you don't understand why you are supposed to come to church. Now, Psalm 84, verse 5 to verse 8. It says, Blessed and greatly favored is the man whose strength is in him, and in whose heart are the highway of Zion. Passing through the valley, of weeping that Baka, they make it a place of springs. The earlier rain also covers it with blessing. Verse 7. Now, this is what is very important. Why God told them to come to church, to come to the synagogue, to go to Zion and to the three formations. He says, why? For they go from strength to strength, increasing in the victorious power. Each of them appears before God in Zion. Every time you appear before God in Zion, in the place of God. Now, I told you Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that we have come upon the mountain. Zion, through the heavenly Jerusalem, to the church of the firstborn, the just man made prophet to Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling, that is speaking better things than the blood of Abel. Every time we come to church, we come up on Mount Zion, and then we go from strength to strength. We receive a victory. That's why Paul was telling us in Hebrews chapter. 10 verse 25, do not forsake the assembly the one that like some of you are doing. Because when we one of us which is a thousand and two of us will be the ten thousand uh, to fly. I understood it long time ago. Even the one I did not feel like it, I went to church. On Monday, I remember 2007, 2008, 9, 10, 11, I was going through horrible things. But I knew I needed to go to the house of God. And uh, every day, from Monday to Sunday, I went to church. I did not care which church it was. My church, they were in Manchester, they had the Sunday service, the Friday service, the Wednesday prayer meeting. Okay. I looked at the church next door. They had another program on Tuesday, <laughs> on Saturday evening. And uh, Saturday, Saturday morning, I looked at uh, the Sabbath keeping the church because they would worship on the Sabbath. So I came. So I was known in many churches. Why? Because I wanted strength. I attempted suicide five times. So when the Lord said, as you appear to be in the house of God, we are going to go from strength to strength. Those are suicidal thoughts are going to be destroyed because when you go to church, the word of God is going to be preached to you. And the word that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. Right now, you don't know enough of the word of God. 
And as you go to they are going to feed you with the right word, that you are going to go from victory to victory, from faith to faith. Notice any Christian that stays at home, his life goes like this. Any Christian that appears in Zion, they go from strength to strength. We are sheep of this pasture. We need to be in the fold. The plan of the enemy is of the, of the wolf is to isolate. You would isolate. That's why coronavirus was the plan of the devil. How many people have suffered from mental breakdown through that coronavirus? Because he wants you to isolate so that you can keep your faith. Many people stop the praying. That Zoom thing destroyed the loss of the people, the faith. But when Daniel, you want to blow me up? <laughs> okay. When Daniel, when Daniel, they passed the decree that you should no longer meet for prayer. Daniel understood what was the problem. He said, I know exactly what you are doing. He decided to fast and pray for 30 days. That's when, when they decreed the coronavirus, the lockdown. We fasted because we understood what was going on. We were not. Ignorant. So if you do not understand what yet he was trying to destroy the pillar of prayer, the pillar coming together in assembly. There were two pillars, that's what he was trying to destroy by isolating us, by stopping us from praying. Daniel understood something great that was at stake, the deliverance of Israel from captivity. May we have uh, understanding of what the enemy is truly trying to do in your life. In Jesus' precious name. Now let us pray. We are going to continue this long now, each one of those pillars, so that you can understand each one of them and know your part to play in that covenant. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We want to give you all the glory and we want to give you all the praise. You don't want us to be ignorant of the pillars that we are supposed to erect in our own life, in our business, in our church. You don't want us to be also ignorant of the pillars that the enemy is trying to destroy in our life. We did not know they were pillars, but now we know. And as we continue through this month, you are going to reveal unto us in detail each one of those pillars that we are no longer going to be victims like Samson, unfortunately, destroy the pillar of holiness. But we are going to be strong and destroy the two pillars and all the pillars of the temple of uh, Satan, like uh, Samson destroyed. And the temple is going to collapse on the own heads in the name of Jesus. And we are going to advance this kingdom of God. In our family, in our businesses, we are going to be strong. We are going to go from victory to victory. In our mind, we are going to have soundness of mind. Any tormenting voice, we command them to leave at once in the name of Jesus. Because you have not given us any spirit of torment, but the power, love, and sound. So I rebuke every single voice that he is speaking in our head. Father, thank you for soundness of mind. Thank you for soundness of spirit, soul, and body. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Let us share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit that be with us now and forevermore. Amen. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Thank you again for coming. There are some refreshments behind. Uh, talk to someone, have some tea, have some coffee, have some sweets, some cake, whatever they have there. Oranges in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. So have something, please. I need some water. My friend, you see, what's wrong with you?